Welcome everyone to CG seminar number 186. Today's topic is can and should assessment nurture an orientation to society and social justice? So there you have it, the most scary thing in education put together with the nicest thing, social justice. So um, of course, both of them being very important and integral to education practice and so the relationship between them is a very important conjunction. And Jan MacArthur from Lancaster University is going to take us through that conjunction today. And Jan, I understand, is going to do the full presentation, but she's speaking from a group which is larger, which includes Margaret Blackie, who's on the Zoom, and um, Nicole Peterson, and also Kaylee Rosewell. Um, so we understand, Jan, that you're part of a larger research group, and you'll no doubt tell us where your um, presentation fits into that, that research program. Um, now, Jan is uh, herself at uh, Lancaster is a coordinator on our, um, or one of our research projects, but she's also a lecturer uh, in higher education and she specializes in curriculum uh, and student learning. So I'm gonna hand over to you at this point, Jan. And, uh, uh, but before I do, I'll not forget the webinar protocols. Um, Webinar is being recorded, as it usually is, and it appears on YouTube within the next 48 hours or so, uh, and also on our website, and we also post the chat from today's discussion. So what you say is going on record for all time. Um, now, as we're conducting the webinar, please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak in the Q&A section. You don't need to keep your camera on. Um, but when we get to the Q&A and you come into the discussion, we'd like you to turn on your camera. It makes it more interesting for everyone. We recommend you use speaker view setting in Zoom so you can see who's speaking at any given time. To ask a question, and we you know, thoroughly invite you to ask a question, uh, use the chat function initially. We can pose the Q&A on the basis of what comes into the chat. By coming into the chat, you signify your interest in speaking and also uh, you indicate what you're going to be speaking about. So we make sure that it's relevant to the presentation. Sometimes people suggest things which are not, but mostly they do. Um, when we get to the point where you're asked to ask a question, um, uh, unmute yourself, uh, turn on your camera, and when you come on, state your name and where you are from. At this point, Jan, the screen is yours. Okay, so I, I hope you can all see that okay. Can see that, Jan, yes. Great, so uh, it's lovely to be here and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so I am speaking on behalf of um, what we call the society group, the four of us listed here. And we though are part of a larger uh, CG project, the Understanding Knowledge Curriculum and Student Agency Project. And you can see all our colleagues listed above. And this has been a longitudinal and comparative four year study of chemistry and chemical engineering undergraduates in the USA, England and South Africa. And when we got to the point of data analysis, we have um, broken into five interrelated groups with mixed membership drawn from the larger team. And as I said, we're the society group. And our sort of mission, I suppose, is to look at um, the relationship, the students' relationships between their self and others, and to do this across a number of dimensions, including why they've come to university, how they engage with knowledge, how they engage with their peers, and assessment, which is what I'll be talking about today. But assessment is just one of our broader themes. Our research today is perhaps slightly unusual for some people because it is positioned in a very strong theoretical foundation and a very particular view of social justice. So we are in a sense doing something reasonably ambitious in that this is comparative and longitudinal. We're looking at subjects that are not traditionally for some people associated with social justice. Um, we're looking at assessment which is always fraught 
and added to that we're bringing in this very particular view. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining our perspective on social justice to help uh, make sense of the rest of the paper. So perhaps a very good place to start to explain critical theory is with the very famous book, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, uh, published, written by Horkheimer and Adorno. And this is frequently described as the bleakest book of critical theory. And if you know anything about critical theory, you'll know that means it's very bleak indeed. Um, the core of the book is that with the progressive domination of nature, which has been a feature of Western society since the Enlightenment, we have come to find that we have caused a domination of ourselves as human beings. That as we objectified the world, um, as Jay says here, we have, we have not escaped objectification, objectification ourselves. So this is the problem for critical theory. And there's not so much a solution, but a way out of it is what Honneth, who's a third generation critical theorist writing today, terms intersubjective self actualization uh, And just to explain what that means, Honneth says, what is just is that which allows the individual member of our society to realize his or her own life objectives in cooperation with others and with the greatest possible autonomy. So you see there, you have that apparent paradox of cooperation and autonomy being intricately linked together. Now, Honneth explains how this is done at some length, which I can't go into now, but it's basically all based on the concept of mutual recognition, that as human beings, we are human beings because we are recognized as such by others. And he has three dimensions of this, but I want to focus on the last one, esteem relationships or esteem recognition, which for Honneth is having knowledge, skills or dispositions that contribute to greater social well-being and are recognised as such. And it's only in having that that we ourselves fulfil our own individual well-being. So another paradox, if you like, is that a person who does not look, does not look beyond their own well-being and consider broader social well-being is unable to realise their own individual well-being. So this is the very opposite of a greed is good, um, a Trumpian, you know, me first idea. Just a final few points from Nancy Fraser, also a contemporary critical theorist. It is a peculiar dialectic of imminence and transcendence. There's one foot in society and one looking beyond. So we're firmly on sitting on that bench there, but we're looking out to the horizon where things could be different. And Fraser distinguishes between affirmative and transformative change. So if we think of um, wealth disparities in a modern capitalist society, affirmative change would be to bring in a welfare state to alleviate some of the symptoms. Transformative change would be to look at the root causes and address that. And a final point from Martin Jay, who's written on the Frankfurt School, uh, the home initially of critical theory, who saw their purpose as increasingly to think the unthinkable. Now, the four of us in our own modest way, not comparing ourselves to the Frankfurt School, but that's what we're trying to do in this work. We are trying to think the unthinkable. We know that what we're talking about is not the way things are done, the way the system is, how things work, what everyone expects. We know that, but we actually believe that there is real value to be had in looking beyond to think differently, even to think the unthinkable. So to turn to the actual um, analysis that we've done within this broader project, the first thing to mention that in STEM, uh, it's really important to understand that assessment often focuses on building blocks, foundational concepts and principles, particularly in the early years. So there's lots of regular assessment in first years. And then this tends to change over later years where these foundational concepts are then applied to project based works that inquire that require perhaps greater decision making. Uh, this, um, our work on assessment here has also been influenced by my own uh, theoretical work on assessment for social justice, 
where I argue that it's not just about fairness or procedures. It's not just about injustice as something that's sort of out there in society. It's about a holistic sense of social justice reflecting this connection between individual and social well-being. And in the CG book, which came out last year, uh, there's a chapter on this, which in a way is a little bit of a pilot for what we're trying to do in this larger work now, um, where I looked at a spectrum of different ways that students relate a sense of achievement to what they do in assessment. So it ranged from one end, students saying, I got an 80% and that's good. It's good in itself. That's the value to much, much more common is students associating assessment with learning, then with the application of the learning, then with the future application in the profession, and then possibly with the future application for the social good. But in our little pilot, there was nobody in the last category, unfortunately, even though they had socially relevant assignments, even in first year. So, we took this as a starting point to think about how we would interrogate the data to understand this sense of self and others in an assessment context. And we generated these three categories. So these haven't emerged from the data, they are how we've interrogated the data. So there's orientation to self, assessment helps me to learn, orientation to dis discipline profession, assessment prepares me for working in the profession orientation to society, assessment is preparing me to make the world a better place. So we took these categories and we applied them to the data we had. The large part of the wider project is a large number of semi-structured interviews with students. We did quite a lot in first year and then uh, selected a number of case study students to follow through the full years. And part of the interview, students were asked to bring and assess a piece of work. In the first year, they could bring anything. In the second year, our key contact in the department identified something that was core to the curriculum. And in the third year, it tended to be a larger project. The discussion of assessment in the interviews, which obviously ranged way beyond assessment, uh, are really rather extensive. Um, the talk about the piece of work is only one part of the student's discussion about assessment. We also had lecture recordings and we also had interviews with key contacts and lecturers. So when it came to the data analysis, um, even though this is a four year project at the time we did this, we had the years one to three in South Africa and England and one to two in the USA, which is why you'll find that today the USA data doesn't feature quite so much. All of these transcripts were coded and one large headline code was student experience and within that a subcode of assessment. And it's this data set of assessment that we applied our three categories to see what sort of orientation a student would have whenever they discussed assessment. And we then, those students who did show evidence of an orientation to society, we took those students and read the full transcripts, not just the assessment parts. We read all years, um, one to three, and generated what we call student stories. So an orientation to self. So of the 427 interviews that we had at the time of this analysis, 303 interviews had one or more mention that we categorized as an orientation to self. And most frequently, these were about linking assessment and learning. So Rafia here, when I was into high school, I used to think the purpose of assessment was just to show the teachers that you can do it. Look, I'll get this mark. Since I've come to university, I've seen that it's about making the knowledge stronger in your head. And we've chosen this quote because we want to really show that there's nothing wrong with an orientation to self. We're not saying that's a lesser form of engagement. We're simply saying that on its own, it's not sufficient for what um, our social justice aims. So orientation to discipline or profession, here we have 108 interviews out of 427, typically looking at assessment helps them to think or behave as a chemist or chemical engineer, seen as vital preparation for going into work in the profession. And this orientation has the most change over time. 
Um, these, are, these are broad figures, but about a fifth of students in first and second years had this type of orientation, but that's doubled by third year. And we think here there's a strong influence of curriculum and assessment design, particularly because in the English sites, three out of four of them have a very large third year project directly linked to the profession. And that comes a year later in South Africa, but it does still happen. Orientation to society though, we have 21 interviews out of 427 and most mentions are fleeting or tangential. So what we were hoping to find, what we believed was important to find, we didn't find, and yet we were not surprised by that either. Where these mentions were made, it was very rare for a student when asked the direct question, what is the purpose of assessment, to make a link to a social purpose. It, it was more common where it did occur to come when they were talking or generally about an work or reflecting on an assignment. These are mainly in the first year, which was a surprise to us because we had thought that what we would see is that over the course of a degree, students would have a stronger sense of an orientation to society as the work they were doing becomes more complex and more directly related to social application. But that's not what we found. And finally, what's interesting is that Two students or several students could bring the very same assignment to the interview and one could talk directly about how this assignment on um, a transport system is directly late, related to social justice or social good and another could talk about it simply in purely technical terms. There were more instances of this, South, this um, orientation in South Africa but what was interesting is that the students didn't explicitly link these to issues of race or social justice, but rather to water scarcity. And this we believe reflects the fact that at this time there was an extremely severe drought in much of South Africa. So while water scarcity is related to race and social justice in South Africa, these students weren't explicitly making that connection. The institution or the course that stood out was chemical engineering at Samarium University. Um, by the way, these are pseudonyms, as you've probably gathered, um, where eight out of 21 of our instances of a social orientation were all from students here. And, and this is, is not, again, not unexpected. In the lecturer interview, the lecturer made clear that there was a deliberate intention to show students that a career in chemical engineering was not confined to big business alone. And the many, many other ways in which the ethos of chemical engineering at this institution is very much about contributing to social justice and solving real social problems. So, but what we found in these few examples was that institutions do build a social and environmental sensibility into the curriculum. And this is reflected in assessment tasks, but students are really making this explicit connection when discussing that assessment. And they do so less often as the degree progresses. And this is despite the fact that the students themselves are making this strong association of assessment and learning. So to delve a bit deeper into what might be happening here, I'm going to share three very truncated examples of our student stories, but they each highlight, I think, a different issue and very much reflect this project is about very close up, fine grained qualitative research. So Harrison first, who's a chemistry student at Erbium University in England. We came to notice him in his third year interview when he was talking about the project he was doing using aubergines to develop affordable medicines. When we then went back through his, all his transcripts, we found that this interest in drug design actually helped inform the course choices he made and it's evident in all three years. In second year, Harrison starts to though think a lot about who he is as a person and says, I have, think I have very strong opinions about things and it can sometimes be polarizing. He talks about himself as not a people person. But then we go to third year and this Harrison who says he's not a people person, he's suddenly talking all the time about helping people. 
So he says, even if all that I did with my life was contribute to a new hemorrhoid cream, I think the fact that I'd potentially be making a new medicine that is going to benefit someone else in some way is nice. If you're preventing suffering with something that you can take with a glass of water, it's pretty cool. If I contribute to some kind of medicine that even is only used for a year, it's not necessarily about my name being remembered, but more the fact that I've contributed to society in some way and made my existence significant in some way. Harrison doesn't know this, but that's the perfect encapsulation of a critical theory idea of intertwined individual and social well-being. So what's happened in year three for this sort of flourishing in Harrison in how he sees himself with and the rest of the world? We know he came to the program with the interest in drug design. It hasn't necessarily been nurtured so far by assessment design, but he's taken opportunities where he can to do work in this field. But it's his third year dissertation that gives strongest voice to this, to all these amazing quotes of which we've only shared some. But there's a really interesting caveat here, because in Harrison's program, as in many others, the choice of third year dissertations is rationed so that to ensure even workload among the lecturers. So there's say six topics and only five students can do each. Students can express a preference, but they don't, they often don't get their preference. So Harrison didn't get the aubergine project when he was first allocated. He got something else that he really wasn't interested in. But then there was some administrative mix up and he got reallocated. And we have to think what would have happened if just for administrative convenience, Harrison had never got to do this third year dissertation. So Scarlett, also a chemistry student, also interested in medicine, see that, saw that as a way into chemistry and then medicinal chemistry. The assessment link is less strong. It came up initially just when she's reflecting back on an assignment and why it mattered to her. But she said, I want to do medicinal chemistry. It could take up to 20 years just to determine whether the thing that you made will help someone. But I think at the end of the day, figuring out that figuring out something that could help cancer, that could help HIV would mean a lot to the whole world. And her second year, her first year, pardon me, is full of these sorts of comments. It's really rich with this social orientation. If I want to go into research and if I want to change the world, if I want to change a problem in South Africa, I will have to study and get my degree and go further on. I've always wanted to help people and try and save lives. I know that there is a lot of urban places in South Africa that don't have medical aid. If a lot of professionals and specialists work together, then that would be a solution to some of the problems that the whole world faces. Then we get to second year and it all disappears. It's not there. All of those wonderful connections to helping the world and changing the world, they're all gone. There is the occasional mention of medicinal chemistry, but it's in terms of lab work and not saving lives. Her career ambition is now to work for a cycling company, which could be linked to social justice, but Scarlett no longer frames it as such. Chemistry is now about problem solving, but she no longer makes the connection to any sense of real or urgent social problems. And in third year, her aspirations, she simply says, I want to be able to walk out as a chemistry student that companies would like to hire. And compare that to first year, I want to change the world. So that's Scarlett. Lastly, we have Nina, who's a Chem Eng student at Samarium University. <clears throat> and she does make an explicit connection between a social orientation and assessment. What I enjoyed about this test was that it was looking at how engineers are making processes that help the population. I don't know if I will work in the chemical engineering industry in terms of chemical processing plants, but I would like to do something that will help the greater South Africa in terms of putting back. And that, again, her first year interview is just peppered with these comments. She talks about a class activity 
one person presents for five minutes on chemical engineering in the news. I think that's good because it's making you aware of what's around you and what is happening. Also explaining the relevance of what we are learning and how it applies to the real world. I just feel that I've chosen this degree, which is very tough. And I want to use it to the people and my country as much as I can, because there are so many other degrees that you could choose to do and sit back because you were just doing it for yourself. The world needs more chemical engineers. Second year, it's not, it's not so prominent in her interviews, but there's still this sense of environmental impact, the world around her and, and connecting to the world. In third year, it, it, it re-emerges again as a skin, as a slightly stronger theme. Just the fact that we are engineers and we are finding solutions to problems that are happening every day in the world. This is her explaining why her degree matters to her. I hope to be helping people and that I can make an impact with what I've learned. So from our three little micro stories, we have Harrison who begins and continues with a social orientation. It's allowed to flourish through assessment in third year, but only due to a procedural accident. Scarlett starts with a very strong social orientation, though only tangentially linked to assessment and appears to lose this along the way. Nina has a consistent and strong social orientation. It's very much nurtured by the course framework and ethos. But we might wonder whether the program has reinforced the social orientation she came in with rather than further transformed. So we are left from, from these different forms of data with clearly the fact that we have not found very much social orientation in when students discuss assessment tasks. So I suppose the first question you might ask is, well, does this matter? Um, why should they do this with assessment? Assessment cannot do everything, this isn't the role. Uh, certification means this is unreasonable to expect. The counter argument that we would put forward is that ass assessment shapes how and what students learn. And we don't just know this from the research literature with fair enough, we could contest in different ways, but these students themselves have strongly associated assessment and learning when it, in their interviews. We don't believe that you can disarticulate knowledge from its social context. It doesn't mean it's always at the forefront when you're learning the names of different chemical elements, but it's still there somewhere. And traditional assessment can work against the mutual recognition we're talking about. It does valorize the idea of a grade. It's good to get an A rather than it's good to have learned how to do something that's going to relieve suffering. And transformative change is very, very difficult. And so we would argue that we do need to see it embedded in nearly all aspects of the student experience. We can then ask why is a socially just assignment not enough? Because clearly there are a lot of those in the programs we've looked at. But we would say that just like trickle down economics, a social orientation won't just occur because academics believe it should. It's got to come from the student. It's clear for academics that these assignments are socially relevant, but it's less so for students who have been shaped over many, many years by competitive assessment systems and a sense that what they should do is please the teacher. And what is essential is that the student's own recognition of the social relevance of their work. Another question that, that preoccupied us a bit was should we expect change during the degree? We had assumed that that would happen with the hierarchical nature of knowledge and the importance of solid building blocks that we would see a slow start and an uptake of a sense of linking what they're doing to society. But we didn't find that. And we also found when we looked at the students who clearly did have a strong social orientation when they came into first year that there's no single point at which it suddenly becomes appropriate to add a social orientation doesn't just happen at some point. It may be foregrounded and backgrounded to different degrees at different times, but we suggest you can't artificially just introduce it at one point, one point even in disciplines with knowledge of this type. 
And finally, we'd refer to Baud and colleagues, very important work, that assessment is about students developing evaluative judgment. And that this doesn't happen in any one place in their degree. It has to be something that's nurtured all the way through. And the idea of evaluative judgment is that when the student three years after graduation is in a lab and doing, a, uh, doing a, a, an experiment, they don't need their teacher to tell them whether or not they've done it well. They have their own evaluative judgment about that. And we want to extend this idea to the evaluative judgment of the social contribution, that students come to see a sense of value in seeing the work, their work as connected with society. We are not saying that assessment is the only site of social orientation and that it should be equally strong in all forms of assessment, but we are saying that it should be there as one, in one place among others. So thank you. Oh, and these are references. Well, uh, well said, Jan. I especially appreciated the way you opened with um, that discussion that situated your argument in a larger philosophical setting. And I think you know, that's what we all should do, you know, with this kind of paper. Um, you've opened up many questions and lots of people are coming in on the chat. I notice at this stage of the presentation, you know, they're being come in at a rush. So we've got at least six questioners lined up uh, and we'll take the uh, first one from Sharon Clarence. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jen and team. That was really, really provocative <laughs> in terms of my thinking. I was just wondering, because as you were talking about how they, they sort of had these almost idealistic senses of I'm going to become a chemist and I'm going to invent a drug that's going to cure cancer. And, and then by a third year, it's sort of, I just want to be employable. I was reminded of my doctor who said that um, in the first three years of medical school, you think what you're going to do is this incredibly um, fabulous thing of sort of treating whole systems and whole bodies and whole people and making a real difference. And then in fourth year, you, you do pharmacology and you learn that it's all just about prescribing drugs. And she says it kind of kills that sense of contributing to the world for a lot of students. And I was wondering if maybe it's just something, there's something there that in first year, you, you can be idealistic because you don't know what it is yet. And then you, you, start maybe learning that certain things that you thought were possible are not possible and and then that's I suppose where assessment and teach conscious teaching around these things becomes more important so that we don't snuff out those lovely lights. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just give a brief answer and then the rest of the team may want to come in. Um, yes, you, you're right that there, there definitely we can there's an idealism in first year um, that goes. And I suppose what we're saying is, does, does it have to go? And it may be what the student needs to do though, is to, to reframe. So yes, it, not everybody is going to be the one person who finds the cure for cancer, uh, the way they express it right. in first year. But still by their final year, even if they see that their role is going to be smaller, that, that big social change comes from lots of us doing very small things, um, mm. then they, they still deserve a sense of recognizing the importance of what they will be doing. So rather than being disappointed and then in a sense become cynical, well, I'm just gonna be a cog in the wheel, they can think I'm going to be a part of something that's really useful. And we would say that's very important to their own well-being. Yeah, thank you. Mags. Yeah, can, can I just add to that? I think it's important also to recognize that certainly from a number of these institutions, there are people doing quite remarkable groundbreaking research within the departments in which these students are situated. So their, their ideals that they're coming in with at first year are not unreachable with even within the context of the department. So whilst I take your point, Sharon, I think that there's, there's also actually good models available to them in human form in the departments. We've um, got a great call list now, nine people lined up to, uh, to ask questions. At some point later, Jen, we'll, we'll take a bunch of questions at once, I think, but let's continue the, the one by one exchange while we can. Our next question is from Hongwei Gu. 
Long way. Um, thank you, Jan. Uh, that was very informative. My question is, how many students display any orientation to society through their responses to assessment tasks? It, it was just 21, actually. That's, thank you for asking that. I should have made that clear. The 21 interviews didn't have any duplicate students in them. So it was, it was 21 students in total. Thank you. Out of 427 interviews. Wow, it's a lot of data, Jan. <laughs> Scary, the idea of curating that data for UKRI purposes is, is frightening. <laughs> I hope Kaylee is sort of ready for this terrible task. Um, is. Uh, the uh, Kanagi Naidu, Kanagi, you have the next question. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, my question is actually, I'm actually from the field of law. And um, obviously, I could resonate with much of what you were saying about, you know, students um, having these grand ideas about wanting to give back to society. Um, and, you know, my question is, you know, would it help uh, for us to have um, assessments that are, you know, um, to a large extent based on disciplinary knowledge uh, so that we could nurture these uh, ideals from the students who exhibit a social um, orientation you know to the assessments and so forth so um, i am quite interested in in how we can nurture um, that desire in a lot of the students who want to give back to the communities that they come from I think the what's coming out of what we've looked at so far is a sense that to do that requires something broader, uh, more encompassing than say just having an assignment which is say about um, how would you help uh, somebody you know evicted from their house in a in a poor area that that that's really good assignment and they're valuable and they're important but there's something broader going on because there's this potential clash for students between working on something that's relating to social um to, to social good and to helping others and an assessment system where they've been taught over years that the important thing is to make sure you get the A, that the A means you've achieved well, to please the teacher and not to really think, reflect on the idea and to be proud of the fact of being and say, I have learned something here that can help people. And you know, the pressure on university students to value themselves in terms of their graduate income, um, or their grade is, is an enormous social pressure. And we realize that that's why we, we realize we're partly thinking and unthinkable here. But to say, if we could just change this emphasis a little bit, we think we could start to make really important change. Do the others want to come in? We've got plenty of people who do want to come in, uh, so I'll, I'll bring another one in now. Thomas, Thomas Godfrey Fawcett, can you come in? Hi, thank you so much. That was a, a super interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm going to try and articulate this properly, uh, if you thought that the, the way in which we think about assessment, we see it as, as a measurement of an individual. It's always done on individuals, and that therefore that kind of engenders an understanding of the purpose of education that is very individualistic itself. We see educated success in education and the purpose of education as being quite individualistic. And so do you think that the structure of our assessment as, as being measuring individuals essentially contributes to that? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's two really important issues that come out there. And one relates back to Sharon's point too, that um, we, we tell students it's about their individual knowledge, but often this is in disciplines where we know that they work as part of a team, that that's essential. Few chemists or chemical engineers, as I understand it, the others will correct me, are, are, are you know, sitting all on their own uh, doing it. it. It is a team-based discipline. And the second thing about the individual, I think you're right, 
And I think this is more ingrained than we realize. And people sometimes think that they um, get, a, they, they solve this by say having group work. Let's have a group assignment and not make it individual. But the students who have been so encultured into this individualistic notion, what do they do? They all go to their tutors and say, my mark isn't fair because that person over there didn't do as much work as I did. So it doesn't, this is I think a good example of how genuine cultural change takes more than just a sort of assignment or a procedure. It's, it really has to address things on a number of issues, number of levels. Well, thank you both. Um, Lara, Lara Lamy, can you come in please? Yeah, sure, sorry. I, um, I apologize if this is um, the wrong kind of question to ask, but um, I was wondering about the curriculum itself and the content of um, what the assessments are kind of based on, because um, how I don't know because I'm a chemistry student and well I'm actually a PhD student but um, I've only recently just got into social justice kind of causes and I because I didn't really think it was for me because we weren't taught about how our chemistry can relate to us as people um, and the world in itself so how does the course content kind of play into it and like how does diversifying and making the course content more um well relating to people like myself um would that have a an improvement in the way in which we see um social justice and um our place in it does that make sense i hope so yeah no it's it's a brilliant question and and absolutely i think that's a really important part of it that the the curriculum does play a huge role here um and but it but on its own it's not the only thing but a curriculum should, people should be able to see themselves in the knowledge that they're learning. Um, and so, you know, we have to diversify our curriculum. I think the idea of involving students more is really important on a number of levels. It's increasingly seen that students have expertise in terms of course design and assessment that academics don't have because they know what it's like to sit that exam. We might from, 20, 30 years ago, but they know what it's like just now, and they can bring that in. Involving students in a broad sense of curriculum and assessment design is really hard because it's very time consuming. And how do you do it in a way that's not what Stephen Rowland would call surface negotiation? So, you know, I say, oh, we're gonna do this. Do you all like that idea? And you say, yes. And I say, great, I'm a good teacher because I've negotiated with you. I did a project where we tried to involve students by actually getting them to work over the summer before a module to help design the module. And do you know the one thing the students wanted to talk about? It was assessment. <laughs> it was the only thing they wanted to talk about. They wanted to leave everything else to the teacher, but they wanted their say about their principles of fair assessment. And they made incredibly valuable points that gave us a perspective that we just couldn't see. So, so you're right. And it's also about this sense of the student having valuing who they are, that they're an equal partner in what's happening. But you don't really feel. <laughs> yeah. But but I think that's where that's the I that's what we should be aspiring to. Okay, thank you. Do we so just quickly? How do we get universities to see that? Isn't it? How do we challenge them to? I know that's a massive million dollar question. Um, sorry, but I just I just I'm struggling to kind of get people to think about how to change the assessment and to think about it in a student perspective. Um, and I know it's more little steps by everyone, but again, it's like where do we start? Well, the way I do it, and I'm not saying this has been revolutionary, is that the thing is socially just assessment and really effective assessment are the same thing. So universities care about whether their graduates are going to come out with the right sorts of things, whether they're going to be seen as, as having developed certain ideas and capacities and all of that and it's the same with good teaching caring for your students isn't just a nice thing to do even though it is it's actually pedagogically incredibly effective you know and so I hate to have to resort to the base argument 
But I think that's the point is to not let people think that those of us who talk about social justice are pie in the sky, airy fairy people. We're actually quite practical, believe it or not, in what we're trying to do here, I think. Indeed, uh, let's hope so. So Yong Lee has the next question. Thank you, Simon. Hi, I'm, I'm So Young from University of Oxford, a DIPO student. Thank you for your fascinating presentation, Jan. Very interesting findings indeed. Um, my question is this. This um, critical realist approach underpinning your research is linking student agency and social well-being, if I understand it correctly, but isn't arguing and expecting students to be more socially oriented and intending to design assessments to nurture students' project for social justice on these approaches in some way undermining students' agency and their ability to develop their own projects, own personal projects? That's a really good question. I saw this in the chat and I was hoping this would come up. Um, I think that's, that's a really good thing to point to us. I don't think it is because I think what, from the critical theory perspective that we have, it was be to say that to realize that sense of agency, they have to realize their sense of self-worth. And that comes through this interlinked individual and social well-being. But also that we're not legislating that there is a certain way in which to link to society. So when we looked um, across the student transcripts, we weren't only looking for people who were doing things that we thought would be nice things to do you know, like curing cancer, we all thought that would be nice to do. But we were just looking for any instance where they were seeing what they were doing in terms of others. And in the few that there were, these were nice things to do. But I suppose, you know, there's a little, again, there's a sort of a, a little theoretical nip there because it has to be a nice thing to do for it to fall into this idea. But there are many, many different ways of doing that. And the whole point here is to have a plural, plural, a many sided um, sense of how we could make a contribution. But I suppose the fundamental point we're saying is that if you don't ever get to see what you do in terms of its worth, in terms of others, that's not necessarily an, an expression of agency. It could as much be that you have been so formed by oppressive social structures that say you're only meant to care about having a big wage. You're only meant to care about getting the A. That what we would hope is if you change a sense of what counts as achievement, you could perhaps open up greater agency. But actually, I'm really pleased you've asked that question because I think we need to address that. Um, that's really good. Thank you, Jan. Thank you both. Um, Amy, Amy Smith. Hi, um, I'm doing a PhD in the moment looking at belonging. And a lot of that ties into what we're talking about in social kind of justice and a sense of community and a sense of purpose. And um, what I want to ask is essentially your thoughts on how the competitive environments of universities and higher education at the moment competes with that sense of community and belonging? And do you think it's possible to have the competitiveness still remaining at universities whilst also trying to embed a sense of social orientation in assessment? If that makes sense. No, it does. It's a really good question. Um, so I'm Australian, so I like competition. You know, I like sports competition and things like that. Competition's okay, but I think it has its place. And in terms of getting the best, in terms of a transformative engagement with knowledge, um, we've, I think we've led students down the wrong path in thinking that it all being about them being better than someone else is, is what matters because it really doesn't help. And I mean, the greatest metaphor for that now is, is COVID, isn't it? We've all learned that it's not just about me. If they're not all okay, I'm not okay. And so I think, I think there is a tension. I think there's, we're not saying that students shouldn't be proud of their achievement. I'm not saying to, you know, 
when you get an A in your in your test, go home and tell your parents and that is fabulous and you know, well done, it's good. But it's just not all there is. Do the others want to come in? I was gonna say colleagues that on the team do feel free to to come in. This has been a really good discussion, um, but you know, you're most welcome to, to add to it at any stage. Put your hand up or send me a message in the chat. Make sure that you are heard. Um, our, next, uh, our next question is coming from Nicola Pallet. Thank you, Simon. Hi, Jan. Um, I'm wondering whether, you know, shouldn't a program be fostering the social justice, a social justice agenda rather than relying on assessment to do all the work, um, given the sort of hidden curriculum around assessment and kind of structures that seem to be working against that agenda. So what is the role of a program? Um, yeah, I think we would agree with that completely. And that's sort of what we're trying to say, but I, maybe I haven't made it, uh, said it quite well enough, that it's not about only relying on assessment. I suppose we're seeing it from the other point of view of saying, if you're embedding this in the program, you can't exempt assessment from being part of that. And, you know, this is a continuation of the age old idea of assessment as the bit at the end, whereas we know that's not the case. And again, and again a lot of social justice, a lot of critical pedagogy writers won't go near assessment because assessment's the difficult bit, you know, that's the nasty bit. And it, and it shouldn't be. So we're certainly not saying it should all happen in assessment. Um, and we don't want to overemphasize the role of assessment. But when students tell us that their strongest association with assessment is that it helps them learn, then surely that's a learning opportunity for bringing in social justice. But you're right, it, it only will work as part of a broader, broader program, a broader university ethos. Um, and really change on many levels. Our next... Um, I think Max and I... had a, a quick point. Sorry, Simon, can oh, I just jump in hand. there? I, I think that the, the thing that, we, that we're saying is that if it's not showing up in assessment, it's probably not happening. So even if you've got the right ethos in your university and the in, in right ethos in your program, if it's, if it's absent in assessment, it's probably not being absorbed. I think, I think that's kind of what we're what we're arguing. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Eliza, Eliza Bruce. Hello, sorry, I can't join by video. Um, my question is, did you notice any differences among the three case study countries in the socio-cultural or economic pressures that were obstacles to assessment for social justice? Uh, for example, was it a funding system which puts pressure on graduates to earn straight away after uni or the exam oriented culture or differences between the institutional mission or maybe a lack of a shared teaching and learning philosophy? Um, and the reason I asked that last point is uh, my own research into social justice pedagogy in Indonesia showed um, differences. In fact, your, the, the story you tell of social orientation tailing off <laughs> um, and you know what you were just talking about now, it, it, assessment um, doesn't actually generally reflect um, a very comprehensive curricular institution-wide commitment. Um, I did find very similar results in the state university I researched, but the two private faith-based institutions, the social justice orientation was there consistently throughout. It was you know, the lifeblood of the institution. So that's why I wanted to add in that final question about if was there any perhaps variation in the institutional mission or this kind of shared teaching and learning philosophy between the teachers and learners. Thank you. Um, just to start with the first point about funding systems and things like that, that is another one of the threads of the society team. And we're, we're looking at that and then hopefully aiming to bring these things together. So I, I think this is a really important question. But some of these things are, are in a sense, the things we haven't done yet, because our first thing was just to look at assessment. Um, there are some institutional and some national differences, but in terms of this particular, and they, they are more apparent in other parts of the data. 
they we were surprised that they weren't more obvious here uh, we had assumed certain things about different countries um, so again what i think is what worries me about what we're seeing is that we are seeing institutions that have very different philosophical views on on learning in different national contexts we're seeing universities that have very different approaches to learning so for example uh, one of our uk uh, one of our english universities they did this fantastic assignment in first year i'm still blown away when i think about it real deep engagement with contested knowledge in chemistry in first year fabulous and yet when it comes to assessment it's just it all goes, it all disappears in assessment. And you know, when students talk about assessment, I mean, and I think this is really worrying because if because that's where they should be seeing the culmination of what they've done. And if we if we separate off and say, well, it's okay, they're doing rich engagement with knowledge over here, and they can see that's linked to society, but then somehow whenever they walk into an exam hall and look at this path they lose it it just seems troubling to us but i think that's a great range of issues there and i i think we're hoping by our multi-dimensional approach in the broader project we will get some of those answers but i don't think we have them yet thank you yeah. please share any links to further um, reports or working papers that come out of this so we can follow that thank you Thanks to Eliza and the comparison with the work in Indonesia is pretty interesting mm. um, role of private education distinctive and, and in, in different countries, isn't it? it often varies more than state education. Um, I, we've got another three or four people, four if Renee Schmidt wants to come in. Uh, and I think what we might do now is take you as a group and then give Jan a sub more substantial space to reply. Uh, I've got one question I want to ask you too, Jan, if we've got time for it at the finish. Um, so uh, if we do that bunching of questions, our next question comes from Zach Spire. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, this was an amazing and brilliant conversation and the presentation was super clear. Um, my question really is simply, how did you approach uh, framing how the institutional policies or practices and planning towards at, at the departmental level or at the institutional level did or didn't frame students' responses to your questions um, and particularly how you made meaning of them. Uh, because uh, I think my question goes towards more of how a student cannot be disarticulated from society um, and how you make meaning of their relationship to the institution and the institution's um, sort of ex exigent or, or preset policy and planning um, towards the students. Thank you. So hold that thought, Jan, and we'll bring in Retha Notzi at this stage. Retha. Hi, um, thank you. Um, thanks for the, the presentation. Um, I'm looking at English and literature, so I'm in a very different place, um, but I am looking at um, using legitimation code theory and your mention of hierarchical knowledge uh, structures made me think, I don't know if that was a uh, reference to Bernstein, um, but I was wondering about whether you think that humanities disciplines, which usually are considered to have horizontal knowledge structures, um, if there's something there in terms of pedagogy that might be useful to bring into STEM disciplines in terms of trying to create a social justice orientation um, for students. Thank you. And hold that one too, Jan. Our third uh, question in this sequence will come from Hina Sul Suleiman. Hina. Um, hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for the lovely presentation. Uh, I personally find it really um, interesting because I've always, uh, I'm an education studies student, so I've um, studied education for the first four or five years, and I've actually done research on alternative methods of education. That's why I kind of relate very much with the, what Jan um, was just saying about uh, in her presentation. And um, this, as a student myself, uh, I have seen... Um, I've seen how I feel like the roles of or knowledge um, student and um, 
and the teacher keeps on changing over the years uh, because um, even though assessment practices are always designed by the um, awarding bodies and the lecturers and all of that, but I think it's it's time that we kind of also um, include students in that um, in a way that because we need to move uh, for more we need to move forward and uh, think more about progressive pedagogies and because uh, learning has obviously changed over the years and assessment practices need to re replicate that. Um, we cannot always teach students using traditional methods and traditional learning theories. Um, and that is why I think uh, students can only reach their full potential once they're given uh, autonomy and they are taught more actively. As Paulo Ferrer says, we cannot treat uh, students like empty vessels and just, you know, uh, uh, fill them with knowledge and stuff and then um, throw them into the real world and expect them to uh, act, uh, you know, be critical thinkers when we're teaching them passively. Mm. I think a lot of people would agree with you, Hannah, about this. Um, last in the sequence of bunch of questions from Renee Schmidt. Renee. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, it's not so much a question, it, uh, it's uh, uh, maybe just an observation. Um, and it's uh, uh, just to say to the society team, well done. Um, your, your paper is, is, is very interesting and it's such an important thing uh, to, to think about how we educate our STEM students um, to get to this place where they think about the impact of, of science and technology on, uh, and engineering on society. So um, just typically from, 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 that, from that angle as um, uh, somebody in an engineering department, um, typically these kinds of assessments would not be seen in um, a technical um, conceptual course where uh, in, in the assessment in those courses, it, it, it is often um, the case that the lecturer may be teaching uh, in a contextual way, but because assessment is always a selection of, of um, you know, you've got a two hour exam and what do you assess? Um, you, you assess the knowledge that builds to the next step. Those things are, are discarded. But um, in the professional degree, uh, an engineering degree, uh, one of the graduate attributes is definitely to consider the impact of engineering on society. And each and every student has to be able to demonstrate that they are able to, um, to consider that and there has to be assessment for that in, um, in an engineering degree. So um, engineering is maybe a little bit different from a science degree in that it's a prescribed curriculum that is built to address very specifically a set of graduate attributes and, and that that is maybe uh, different places where you would see that kind of engagement uh, in an assess at an assessment level. It may be there in the course and it may be there in the material, but at an assessment level, it may be somewhere else in the, in the degree, it may be happening somewhere else. Thanks, Renee. Um, Jen, uh, the thing I was going to ask you before you give your omnibus right of reply is, um, you know, you've seen today, you've started and, and, and led a very good discussion about the work uh, and the clarity with which you presented, of course, contributed greatly to that. Um, what's next and what's next from the team? What, what will you bring forward for us to chew over in the way we've chewed over this today? Um, I think now you could uh, take on all of us, uh, all five of us. Okay, in one minute. Yeah, well, as long as you need. We always sneak a bit past uh, three o'clock UK time in this webinar series, but try and close down by 10 past. Um, so uh, I hope I've got a little note of the questions. I think the first one was about how what we're doing relates to institutional culture and or in, institutional organisation. 
Um, I think that's a really helpful question and probably not something we've as yet looked at in some depth. And I think that will come out more as we bring the different streams together. Um, but we do have extensive information about that. Um, I suppose it is a principle of the sort of assessment for social justice approach is that institutional policy is never going to be the only place to get things done. Um, policy is important, but policy is not everything and an awful lot happens, good or bad, under the radar of policy. And basically it's, you know, you can't legislate for social justice, but you can certainly have organisational structures and policies that can, can provide an environment to nurture it. And you have some that do and some that don't. That's probably a bit vague, um, but I'll take that away to think about. We all will in our next meeting. Um, the idea about the hierarchical, it's not my understanding that's not coming from Bernstein as such, um, but is because it's very particular about the nature of knowledge in, in chemistry and chemical engineering, uh, which those of us on the program who aren't in the project, who aren't chemists and chemical engineers, we've learned a lot. Um, the idea that, but the idea that could help humanities help STEM subjects, this is really interesting. And I think we're gonna take this back to the full project team because I think my colleagues in STEM, well, chemistry and chemical engineers would say, they don't necessarily need, I don't know whether they need the humanities help. They may say that STEM has been wrongly portrayed as not being fertile ground for social justice and that they have their own ways of doing it. That said, I think all disciplines learn from one another. Um, and so actually, you know, humanities needs to understand STEM um, because STEM is so crucial to, to social life and, and STEM needs to understand humanities. Um, so it wasn't legitimate legitimation code theory sneaking in there. Um, but, uh, but thank you for that. The idea of active learning and Paulo Freire, yes, absolutely. And I think what we're trying to say is that even in these subjects where you do have these hierarchical forms of knowledge, there is, there is a third way between banking education and pouring you know, chemical formulas into the empty vessel of the student and the student just being able to make it up as they go along, that science, chemistry and chemist does require disciplined engagement with knowledge, but the student doesn't have to be made passive to do that. And in fact, it's really damaging to say a student's gonna be passive for two years and then bang, we're gonna pop a switch and tell them to now be active. That's, that's not going to work, but so I, I agree with that. The idea um, of graduate attributes, yes, it is very, very strong and we didn't have the space in the presentation to say about how these things are there in engineering um, particularly. I suppose this is something for us as a project team, again, to debate. It is possible to have graduate attributes and for students to very convincingly align what they've done with those graduate attributes, but then to not have really genuinely internalized a sense of a social orientation. You know, graduate attributes can be extremely positive, but they equally, if, if, done, if, if, if done in the wrong way, can be another set of hoops for a student to jump through. And so I suppose what we're saying is that we're looking at something that's about a more internalized sense of achievement rather than the graduate attributes someone else um, decides on, which are important and the professional body does need to have those. But as well as those, we're talking about something else as well, not instead of. What next? Um, so the society team is now working on our second paper, which is looking at how students um, understand diversity and in a sense, their self and others. Uh, you know, so is diversity something that's important if you like a similar framework? Diversity is important because 
I'm a woman in a large cast of chemical engineers and I don't want to be outnumbered, would be a sort of view of diversity that's fairly inward looking compared to diversity is important because to solve the world's problems, we need a more inclusive, diverse culture. So that's sort of where we're going there. And we have two other themes. And the idea is that we bring all of these themes together into a synoptic piece about relations to self and society. And the other projects are doing the same. We all set off to write one paper and each one of the five teams is now writing about five. Um, and then we're going to then have the mega discussion where we start discussing between the, pro the society team and the knowledge team, the study practices and the society and so forth. And uh, quite a lot of exciting stuff to come from us, Simon, I hope. Yes, I think so. We're going to see an enormous amount of material in the end and uh, some some books as well as articles and, and, and chapters. So really look forward to that. And this is a really major research program that one of the most important in the world at the moment in education, in my view. Um, look, thank you, Jan, and thank you for such a, leading such a good discussion uh, and sharing your work with 90 plus people from around the world. And it was really good to have the South African presence in the webinar today. Um, I want to also thank Margaret and uh, and Nicole and uh, Kaylee, who's had to leave to do some project interviews, I believe, uh, for the, for your contribution to this ongoing work. You know, really significant. We really appreciate it. Um, look forward to seeing you all uh, on Thursday. It's been a great pleasure to share this series, I have to say, since we began it last April. And uh, it's been particularly good to chair it this calendar year where every webinar has been really good um, and on a variety of topics with a variety of presenters, but all high quality discussion. Unfortunately, we're going to lower the tone significantly on Thursday because I will be presenting about Australia. So Jan, when you talk about your own country, you, you know, you're just too subjective, aren't you? It's shocking really. But fortunately, my colleague Minto, Minto Felix is sharing the presentation with me. So the tone will be somewhat lifted in the second half of the presentation. We're gonna talk about um, what's going wrong in Australia with higher education funding uh, in the wake of the collapse of the international student population with the, all the airports closed to international students uh, drop of, from 500,000 to 125,000 international students has decimated the funding position of Australian science and the long-term damage is going to be very significant. Uh, we're going to talk about that problem and try and alert people to the problem, perhaps to put some pressure onto the Australian government. Our dear, dear hope would be to see the webinar achieve something in that regard. Um, look forward to seeing you then. Uh, Trevor's um, notified us all about the uh, the details of today and also of Thursday in the chat today. Once again, thank you, Jan. Thank you very, very much for all you've done. And we look forward to more from your team. And it's bye for now from me to everyone.